In these next set of lectures, we're going to be going into the realm of truly big data. Okay? And uh, big data is super fun because there's a lot of it, and there's a lot that we can glean from it if we have the right techniques. Um, but to get started, what we're going to do is talk about what it means for some data to be big and the various ways a data set can get big. Okay? So the first way the data set can get big is that there could simply just be a lot of numbers. Right? So imagine you collected data on the, the length of the thumb, or the left thumb of all of your friends' hands. Okay? So that would be your data set. You'd have all of your friends and a number for each of them. So the size of the data set would equal to the number of friends you have <laughs> that you can convince to let you measure their thumb. So that's probably not a humongous data set. But let's imagine that you measured the length of the left thumb of everyone in the United States or everyone on the North American continent, or everyone in the world. Now suddenly, this data set, even though it's a simple number, simply one number for every individual, can become extremely large and, and very, very complicated to deal with because um, you know, there's a lot of challenges um, having to do with just doing simple operations when you have a data set that's very large. Um, and so, that is one way for data to be large. And so be explicit. Let's say that we have a uh, data matrix X, OK? And then I'm going to organize it in the following way, where I'm going to take a measurement for each individual and uh, each sample. So each row is a sample, right? And then I'm going to have a number for each of these samples. And even though this is a, uh, a one-dimensional data set, it could get quite large if the number of samples you have is large. Okay? Now, let's imagine that um, we do something a little more complicated. All right? Let's say that for each row of your data matrix, instead of taking one measurement, we're going to take two measurements. So my data matrix X now uh, becomes something more than just a vector. I'm still going to organize it exactly the same way, where rows are samples. But for each individual in the sample, so for each person, let's say that I measured the length of their thumb as well as the length of their index finger. So now suddenly, I have a two-dimensional data set. Right? So these numbers, importantly, correspond to each other. Okay? And so every time you take an individual row, those literally correspond to one individual. And the size of my data matrix X is now going to be 2 by n, right? where the columns are the measurements. Right? And uh, n rows are samples, and I have n of them. right? And so this type of data is relatively straightforward to visualize. If you wanted to look at it, what you can do when we look at it would be to make a plot where I put all of the individuals visuals on the horizontal axis. And by measurement, on the y-axis, and put down a dot and make a scatter plot for all of the individuals, however many dots there are for the number of individuals. Okay. Now, if I had two measurements, I can still visualize it relatively straightforwardly. So what I would do is make a scatter plot of the measurement 1, what I'm going to call x1, versus x2, which is whatever the second measurement is. Right? So for example, let's say that this is the length of the sum, thumb versus the list of the index finger. And if I pull up one dot down for every single individual, I might end up with a scatter plot that looks qualitatively something like that. Again, a dot for every individual. Okay. Now let's suppose that let's get creative. Let's just measure more stuff. All right. So instead of just measuring two numbers from each individual, we're still going to take uh, rows as samples. All right. And we're going to take n rows here, and let's take uh, m measurements. 
So suddenly, this becomes a more and more rich data set as you take more and more measurements for each individual, right? So, for example, let's take for each person, for each row, we're going to measure the length of their thumb, the length of the index finger, the length of every other finger, how much they weigh, how tall they are, what their shoe size is, what their cholesterol level is, and so on and so forth. And if you think about all the things you can possibly measure about each individual person. And stuff into this data matrix where every row corresponds to all the numbers for each person. This is what we call a high-dimensional data set, and this is one of the other ways that data can get very big very fast. Not simply by having more and more individuals and more and more rows, but actually having a very large number for m, right? So what do I mean by dimension? Why do I call it a dimension? Well, if you go back here into the two measurement data set, right? Recall that we could visualize it by making a scatter plot of the following kind, right? Where we plot、um, one measurement on one axis and the other measurement on the other axis, right? So, and essentially, what we're doing is considering each measurement as a dimension, right? So this is the horizontal dimension, and this is the vertical dimension. Now, if we had a third measurement, we could perhaps make a three-dimensional plot, having another axis that comes out of the board towards you or towards me. It doesn't really matter, and having that be the third dimension of my data set. Okay. Now, ordinarily, two or three is what you are limited to, right? Once you have more than two or three dimensions, you can plausibly plot three dimensions.、Um, maybe if you had a fourth dimension, you can use an animation. So use time as one of those dimensions.、So、you have a scatter plot in three dimensions that rotates and kind of changes in time. You can plausibly visualize. More than three dimensions by using some of those、uh, tricks that we can we can we can do by being able to code and and making animations and making pretty visualizations that way. But once you get beyond that, we're going to start having a real problem. Okay, if m is a large number, what if it's ten? What if it's hundred? What if it's a few hundred thousand or even larger? That m becomes the dimensionality of my data set, and they can become very very hard to handle. And so the challenge there is how do we deal with these high-dimensional data sets? How do we deal with data sets that have both have a large number of rows, large number of samples n, and a really large number of measurements for each of these rows, right? And so the challenge here is that we have these data sets, and we'd like to be able to visualize them. It's not straightforward how to do this without bending over backwards or making tons and tons of these pairwise scatter plots, which is always unsatisfying. We'd like to be able to analyze them, right? We talked about some analytic techniques in the couple, next last couple of weeks,、uh, for example, regression. And there, we actually went ahead and generalized some of the theory for doing multivariate regression. So, doing doing regression not only in one measurement but in multiple measurements. So that's something that generalizes. And so this is、um, something that we seek in general: Are the analytic techniques that we're using generalizable to high-dimensional multivariate data instead of just relatively simple data? Right. This is something that we'd like because. As we as we saw in the simple example of、uh, measuring individuals or humans, these data sets can get very high dimensional very fast. And lastly, and of course not leastly, we would like to be able to understand these high dimensional data sets, not only visualize them and analyze them, but also glean some insight from these high dimensional data sets. So, in the realm of,、um, of public health and also personalized medicine, for example, this becomes very, very relevant. Right? These high-dimensional data sets are what our doctors are collecting, and to some extent, the, gr- the, the, the goal of understanding these data sets is what physicians do in their heads with all of their learning. Right? So, you, as a physician, might see lots and lots of patients, and so in your head, you're building up this X ma- data matrix here. Right? For each person, what are the various symptoms that they have? What are their physical characteristics? What is their family history? What is their medical history? What is the environment? What are their、uh, what are what is their genetic analysis? If you go that far, right? And so this M for that data set could be extraordinarily large, 
And what we would like to do is, instead of doing this on a personal by person basis or a physician by physician basis, have the capacity, the analytic capacity, to be able to analyze that data set and glean patterns from it that might be of really great impact to the human health. And so the goal there is understand the data. And understanding the data is, uh, is kind of twofold, right? So first, uh, first you can, it depends on what you mean by understand, right? So first, we can, we can do pattern analysis. We can find patterns in the data where maybe two of the factors um, usually co-occur, right? And that's something um, that if you only had two measurements, it's relatively straightforward to assess whether or not there's some kind of correlation between them. But when you have so many measurements, if all you're doing is pairwise correlation, it is both extremely tedious as well as inaccurate. But what we would like to do is understand these patterns and look at the entire data set, this giant high dimensional data set as a whole, and see if there's any high dimensional patterns that emerge. And the other, um, the other aspect of understanding the data, the part of this challenge, is prediction, right? As always, as we've been talking about over and over again, it's all about if I gave you another person and gave you some subset of their symptoms and characteristics, can you guess in an intelligent and informed way what we might expect to see for the other measurements based on all the wealth of data that we've seen so far? Right? So all of these things are what we're after. There's a lot of techniques out there that are um, useful for high dimensional data sets. And so we're going to go through just a few of them that uh, are the foundations as well as the most commonly used ones when people are dealing with high dimensional data sets. Um, and so it's really important to keep in mind this picture in your head of what is the size of the matrix, of the data matrix that we're looking at, right? So remember that X is a data matrix of N rows by M columns, where N is the number of samples you're collecting either independent ones, static ones, or in time, and M is the measurement that you're taking for every single one of them. And so the list of measurements by their indices have correspondence, right? So the 101th uh, element of the first column corresponds to the 101th row <laughs> of, the, of the whatever other, other column you're looking at, right? Those come from the same individual. And so depending on how you index your, your data matrix, you can take slices of data, right? So keep this picture in mind. Um, and, um, and as we keep going, we're going to be coming back to this picture and talking about high dimensional data sets and a couple of things that we can do in order to visualize, analyze, and understand them.